Darkcast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasting. It's one of the most perplexing missing persons cases in Vermont's history. On March 19, 2004, 17-year-old Brianna Maitland finished her shift as a dishwasher at the Black Lantern Inn in Montgomery, Vermont. It was already after 11 p.m. and Brianna told co-workers she needed to get home to get some sleep before her shift at a different restaurant the next morning. She only made it about a mile before something horrible happened. It was several days before people in Brianna's life realized she was missing, even though her crashed and abandoned vehicle was found the morning after she was last seen. Despite this, police initially wrote Brianna off as a troubled runaway, though her family immediately knew that something much darker was behind their daughter's vanishing. 20 years later, despite intense investigations, hundreds of tips, and even more rumors, Brianna Maitland has yet to be found. But police believe that there are people in the sleepy Vermont town who know exactly what happened to the teenager. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell you the stories of those who never came home. Today, I want to tell you the story of Brianna Maitland. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is... And then they were gone. back everyone welcome back thanks for joining us once again i'm kona and i'm ethan and we're the husband and wife team behind this podcast each week i tell you the story of an unsolved missing persons case ethan doesn't know anything about the case going into the episode and he is here to provide his reactions and questions in real time hopefully asking some of the same ones you have at home now this week we are bringing you a case that several listeners have asked for over the years Brianna Maitland's case is pretty high profile. It's in the true crime community. It's like got to be one of the top ones. It's been covered on Disappeared, Dateline, and countless other crime shows and podcasts. I'm assuming you have never heard of it? Correct. Yeah. Okay. No idea. Yeah. I decided to finally do this case this week because... This week, as we're recording this, marks the 20th anniversary of Brianna's disappearance. The FBI held a press conference on March 19th, basically in hopes of putting her name and story back in the news cycle. So I figured, why not help out? Sure. Makes sense. This is what I keep on telling, having to tell myself in the course of doing this podcast when I shy away from the higher profile cases. There are still people who have never heard about this before. I'm me being one of them. Yeah. And, you know, you're not alone. And so even though something may be big in the true crime community, it that doesn't mean it's big in society at large. So all of these cases, whether they're high profile or underreported, deserve to have their stories told. We just, you know, typically like to try to do the underreported cases as much as possible. Now, I also need to tell you that this is our first two-parter of season five. You hope it's going to be a two-parter. I think it is. I think I separated it. Uh, I, all right, listen, like, honestly, because this case has been covered so much, I really thought this was going to be a short episode because other, you know, it's been done in depth other places, right? So I was like, we're just going to kind of tell the basic story and call it a day. Then I just kept on writing and I could not stop. You know, in my research, I learned a lot of things that I didn't personally know about this case. Because again, I, even though I knew about it and I've, you know, seen it on Disappeared or whatever, like I've never really gotten too deep into it. Mm, okay. So I was learning a lot. And um, yeah, now I'm going <laughs> to pass all of that on to you. All right. <laughs> in, over the course of two weeks. 
So the way two parters work is this episode will be released on Friday, March 22nd. Part two will be released on Friday, March 29th. However, if you belong to our Patreon on any level or subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, you will get part two as soon as I finish recording and editing it. (laughs) We usually try to post them together, but uh, we're a little bit behind the gun this week. Uh, Because like I said, this just took a lot longer than I was anticipating. But as soon as I get it, it will be up early. On that note, before we get started, I want to give a shout out to the newest folks who have joined us over on Patreon. So thank you very much to Cassandra S. and Jennifer. I hope you enjoy both parts of this episode, and we really appreciate your support. Thank you so much. All right. I know that's like too much talking before we get to the story. I feel like people are already going to give us negative reviews about the banter. So let's get to the story of Brianna Maitland. Brianna Alexandra Maitland was born on October 8th, 1986 to Kelly and Bruce Maitland in Burlington, Vermont. Brianna was raised along with her older brother, Waylon, in a farmhouse located in East Franklin, Vermont, about 300 feet from the Canadian border. Whoa. Which I can't even picture that, honestly. Yeah, no, I'm terrible with geography, but like, I guess I didn't realize, and forgive me, Vermont listeners, but I didn't realize that Vermont was right up against Canada. Well, so I knew that only because I I went there one time when I was like 12, and in the hotel we would get like Canadian television channels. Oh. But I didn't know you could just have a house 300 feet from the border. Like, that's wild to me. I mean, why not? It's an unsecured border. I guess, but I don't know. So that is geographically where she was. Now, East Franklin is a tiny town, I think maybe about 7,000 people. And we're going to talk about a lot of towns in this because Vermont is a tiny state. And so it is very easy to go from one town to another, you know, within like a couple miles of each other. Brianna had what seems to be a typical small town childhood. But if you listen to her friends, it seems as though Brianna was also insecure and desperately wanted to be liked. It really shows you that often self-esteem isn't based on what's visible to others. Brianna was a beautiful teenager. She was fun. She was smart, athletic, and had trained extensively in jujitsu. She seems like the type of person who you would look at and think, what does she have to be insecure about? But, you know, you just don't know what's going on inside of somebody's head. I bring all of this up because I feel as though Brianna's need to be accepted likely led to her disappearance, either directly or indirectly. For her first few years of high school, Brianna attended Missisquai Valley Union High School. Her friend group, however, mostly attended Enosburg Falls High School, so Brianna wanted to transfer there. In the episode of Disappeared about her daughter's case, Kelly says that there weren't any stressors at home, but that Brianna was looking for more independence. However, in an article that was published in the Burlington Free Press on April 4th, 2004, just a few weeks after Brianna went missing, her father Bruce paints a different picture. He said that tensions in the home caused him to decide to move out. Brianna had already been talking about switching schools, so he proposed that the two get an apartment together in Enosburg Falls. The plan never came together, and Bruce ended up moving back home. But Brianna, who was 17, decided that she was still going to move out. Bruce told reporter Sam Hemingway, quote, I guess she felt if I could move out, she could too, end quote. In terms of who Brianna moved in with, those reports also differ. This article says that she moved in with a boyfriend, but the episode of Disappeared said that she moved in with a friend before moving in with two different boyfriends. Either way, it seems as though Brianna hopped around a bit before finding a good fit in the home of her longtime friend, Jillian Stout. And this is when she was 17 and still in high school, right? Correct, yeah. I mean, I would assume that her, at least one of her parents was helping, signed off on this. Like, Yeah, know. I mean, they both seem to be fine with it. Okay. Like, it doesn't sound as though she had any sort of falling out with her parents that led her to leave. It sounded like she's just like, well, you know, I want to go. Like, I want to do something else. And they were just fine with it. Mm, Interesting. Yeah. So all of this was going on in late 2003 into early 2004. Now, unsurprisingly, a 17-year-old who wasn't living with her parents ended up doing a lot of partying during this time. Oh, weird. 
It got to the point, however, where Brianna's friends began to worry. Shauna LaBelle grew up in East Franklin with Brianna. She said that once she moved out of her parents' home and started going to that other school, that she began to change. Growing up, Shauna and Brianna used to go four-wheeling and hang out at the beach at Lake Carmi. But when she started hanging out with these new kids, her activities went from hanging out in the sun to partying with a rougher, older crowd and experimenting with drugs. Brianna's partying got so bad that in early 2004, Shauna had a sit down with her friend. In that Burlington Free Press article I mentioned, Shauna said, quote, she was partying a lot and it was a crowd I didn't like seeing her with. I talked to her about it time and time again. I said, you've got to stop hanging around those people and get yourself together, end quote. This all came to a head on February 27th, 2004. Brianna was at a party and was attacked by Keely LaCrosse, another teenage girl with whom she had been friends. Shauna described the events leading up to the attack, and I think it gives important insight into Brianna's personality. So I just want to play it for you here. Brianna was partying a lot, and she was loud and goofy, an attention seeker. She did want attention from boys. She wanted to know that she was pretty. And even if it was a negative or positive attention that she got from a male, it was still attention. On this night, Brianna got the wrong kind of attention, making one of her girlfriends jealous and angry. So it sounds like Brianna was flirting with this girl's boyfriend, but it doesn't seem as though Brianna had any intention of taking it further. After all, she was at the party with her own boyfriend. Oh. Basically, this incident happened. Keely started to get pissed, and then Brianna decided to remove herself from the situation. So she left the party and then went out to her boyfriend's truck, where she just waited for him to take her home. Oh, okay. But Keely came out first. According to Shauna, Keely knocked on the passenger side window and Brianna rolled it down. Keely then punched Brianna in the face at least twice, leaving her with two black eyes, a broken nose, and a concussion. Jesus. Yeah. Like it, I mean, there are pictures online and it looks brutal. Brianna was hospitalized for her injuries and Shauna convinced her to file a police report against Keely. Brianna was initially hesitant to file the report, but Shauna convinced her that it was a good idea. It had to have been more than two punches. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to say, you know, reports kind of vary. It was several, you know, two, yeah. at least two. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty severe. Yeah. Wow. Brianna's mother, Kelly, talked about this incident on Disappeared, and I think her characterization also gives some valuable insight into Brianna's personality. So, you know, after Kelly heard about this and like saw her daughter's face, she asked Brianna why she didn't fight back. Because remember, she's trained in jujitsu, right? Right. But according to Kelly, Brianna told her that she didn't want anybody to be mad at her. Mm. And I think that's why she was also hesitant to file the police report, despite her, you know, pretty extensive injuries. Yeah. So attention seeking, but conflict avoidant. Mm hmm. Yeah. Around the same time, at the end of February, Brianna decided to drop out of school and get her GED instead. I've never seen any reason given for this, but, you know, it seems reasonable to assume that this attack probably had something to do with that. Yeah, I can't imagine that uh, her social scene was very comfortable after that. Yeah. So around this time, again, the timeline of like all of this is kind of fuzzy, but sometime in early 2004, it sounds like Brianna moved into her friend Jillian Stout's home in Sheldon, Vermont. Now, like I said, we're going to be talking about a lot of different small towns, small towns. So, for instance, Sheldon, where Jillian lived, is only about 10 miles from East Franklin, where Brianna's parents lived. Okay. By the time Brianna moved into Jillian's house, it seemed as though she was kind of over her party phase. Or at least slowing down. According to Jillian, quote, she didn't party when she moved in with me. She didn't want to party. She'd come home, read a book, or watch TV, end quote. Well, that fight probably had something to do with that. Right. But I think from other things that I've read that she actually moved in prior to the fight. So I don't really know what to think about this quote. And this quote is from one of the early newspaper articles on Brianna's disappearance. Because it kind of gives off like 
the vibe of I swear, officer, I was home reading the Bible. Like, you know what I mean? (laughs) Like her friend has just gone missing and she's like trying to portray her in the best light possible. Sure. But on the other hand, it does seem as though Brianna was taking her life seriously at that time. She was working two jobs and she was actively taking GED classes. But Brianna disappeared just a few short weeks after this party and altercation. So it seems like she may not have fully been able to extricate herself from that part of her life. On Friday, March 19th, 2004, Brianna started out her day with a math test. This was the last part of her GED examination, and she passed. Oh, good. Yeah. Her mother was thrilled for her, so she took Brianna out uh, to eat and then on a shopping trip to celebrate. Bruce was out of town on business at the time, so it was just the two of them. That afternoon, they went to St. Albans, another town nearby, to go clothes shopping. While they were in the checkout line in one store, Kelly says that she saw Brianna looking outside toward the parking lot. She then told her mom that she needed to go for a minute and that she'd be right back. She headed out, and then Kelly met back up with her in the parking lot after she finished paying. She later said that Brianna appeared shaken and agitated, but Kelly didn't want to pry, so she didn't ask her daughter what was wrong. Kelly then dropped her off at Jillian's house so Brianna could get ready for work that evening. So it's probably fair to assume that that was her friend Keely. Yeah, maybe. I mean, we really don't know. It it could have just been anybody. But yeah, clearly somebody with whom, you know, she had some sort of issue with. Yeah, issue with or something. But I feel like if it were Keely, she wouldn't have left the store to go see her. You know, she probably would have just like stayed in line and kind of, you know, pretended not to see her. Uh, Yeah, maybe. So I don't know. Now, this was 2004. So while plenty of people had cell phones at the time, they weren't ubiquitous. Brianna, for instance, did not have a cell phone. So before she left the house, she wrote a note to Jillian that said, quote, I get off work between 10 and 12. I'll see you after, end quote. Brianna then drove the 20 miles or so to Montgomery to start her shift as a dishwasher at the Black Lantern Inn. It seems as though Brianna's shift was the closing shift. So after they were done, the staff cleaned up. Several of the employees hung around to chat, but Brianna said she had to get home and get some sleep because she had to go to her other job the next morning. This account of what she said to her co-workers and, you know, when she left came from the episode of Disappeared. As we go on, police give differing accounts of what she said to her co-workers before she left, but the episode of Disappeared is the most recent thing, so... So I know we'll get into it, but is the difference in accounts where she was going? Yeah. Okay. But by all accounts, Brianna left the Black Lantern at about 1120, but she never made it home. And you said it was 20 miles? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so that fits in with the timeline that she gave to Jillian in her note. You know, I'll get off by between 10 and 12. I'll see you then. That's kind of also why I think it was the closing shift, because when you have the closing shift, you never know exactly when you're going to be able to leave. Right. It depends on how long it takes you to clean everything. Yeah. And when the last customers actually leave and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what happens next is very similar to the Gretchen Fleming case out of West Virginia that we recently covered. Like Gretchen, Brianna's parents lived nearby, but she wasn't living with them. So they didn't realize that she didn't make it home that night. Right. Jillian noticed, her roommate, but she just assumed Brianna had decided to spend the night with a boyfriend or go back to her parents' house for the weekend. But when Brianna wasn't back after the weekend, Jillian began to get concerned. On Tuesday, she called Brianna's parents and asked if she was staying with them, but they hadn't heard from her since Kelly dropped her off at Jillian's house on Friday afternoon. After learning that Jillian hadn't seen her since then either, the Maitlands called police to report Brianna missing. So we're talking a time lapse of roughly around 1130 Friday. And now what time are we on Tuesday? Yeah, Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning. Mm -hmm. That's a long time. A long time. 
By this point, it was March 23rd, and Brianna had been missing for over three full days. Despite the fact that Brianna was only 17 and not legally an adult, it doesn't sound as though the police were particularly concerned with the Maitland's report. It took two more days for them to ask Brianna's parents to come down to the police barracks to give them more information. So she's been missing for five days at this point. Yeah, so I haven't heard anything that happened between Tuesday and Thursday. Everything really seems to kick off when they go there in person on Thursday. So now we're on Thursday, March 25th, and the Maitlands go down to the state police barracks. No one had seen their daughter in over five days, but as they were about to find out, that didn't mean that there hadn't been any sign of her in that time. According to Kelly, when they went to the police station to report Brianna missing, they gave all of her pertinent information, photos, where she lived, where she was last seen, and a description of her vehicle. The description of the vehicle caught the attention of a trooper who was just hanging out in the barracks. And he pulled a photo out of his notepad and asked the Maitlands if that was Brianna's car. The photo was of a pale green 1985 Oldsmobile sedan that had crashed into the side of an abandoned house. It was Brianna's car. Okay. I'm already getting infuriated by this. Like, yeah. Okay. So I'm assuming we're going to get into uh, the backstory of what this trooper was called to this house for. Oh yeah. It's wild. Okay. Yeah, I'll the whole reserve thing is- my frustrated comments. Then. The whole thing's crazy. So if you listen to our show regularly, the next part may sound familiar. That's because it echoes the circumstances of Phoenix Colden's disappearance, which we covered earlier this season. In that one, Phoenix's car was found in the middle of the road, and the officer who found it towed it away without making any attempt to find the owner. Right. And and, and by some accounts, the door was left open. Right. In the middle of traffic. Right. in In a travel lane. In a travel lane. But according to the officer, it was off and the door was closed. But regardless, in this case, on the morning of March 20th, The morning after Brianna was last seen, so, you know, six hours, eight hours, like, not long. Right. Motorists reported seeing a car that appeared to have backed into an abandoned home that the locals referred to as the Dutchburn house. And, okay. Um, Vehicle hit the house going in reverse. Yes. Is there damage to the car? Yeah, the car... Appear well. It, it's a 1985 Oldsmobile. Sure. So, <laughs> I guess more of what I mean is like, did it appear as though uh, the vehicle hit the car or the vehicle hit the house at a high rate of speed? High-ish, right? So, um, I'll get into the specific okay damage. Okay. Um, but yes, it was not gently backed into the the house. Okay. Next question: Why is it called the Dutch Burn House? Okay, I'm glad you asked because this is kind of an aside, but it's part of the story that I had never heard before, and it's incredibly creepy, so I wanted to share it. The house was called the Dutchburn House after the previous owners, two elderly brothers named Myron and Harry Dutchburn. In 1986, the two were brutally beaten during a home invasion. They both survived, but their injuries were so severe that they had to go into nursing homes for the remainder of their lives. Okay. Yeah, this was back in 1986, so I don't know who lived in the house after that or like what the deal was with it. But by the time Brianna's car crashed into it, the house had been abandoned and boarded up for about six years. Okay, so there was somebody else past the brothers living there i guess i don't know i it nothing i read mentioned anybody living there but yeah but then it said that it had only been boarded up for six years so maybe it was just there like preserved until then and then they boarded it up kind of like our creepy neighbor behind us Mm -hmm. weird okay so the state trooper gets a call about a car that has crashed into the dutchburn house and goes to check it out He looks around. Nobody's there. Inside the car, 
he sees two uncashed paychecks sitting on the passenger seat. They're made out to Brianna Maitland. The keys weren't there, so he wasn't able to get into the trunk. Okay, is the car unlocked? I believe the car itself was unlocked, yes, but not the trunk. And because it was a 1985 Oldsmobile, it doesn't sound like there was, you know, a latch. You had to open the trunk with a key. Okay. So um, I don't have much more information about what else was inside the car. It doesn't seem that there was anything super interesting. Um, Outside of the car was a water bottle, an unsmoked cigarette, and a broken necklace. Now, this was an abandoned house, however, so the officer didn't know if any of the items around the car were related or if it was just trash that had been left out there previously. Sure. According to the officer, the car's interior appeared normal and there was no sign of a struggle. The car had backed into the side of the house and one of the boards that had been covering the home's window had fallen and was resting on the trunk. Okay. So basically... Here, actually, I'll just show you a picture. Okay, so you're looking at a picture right now. The car crashed into the house, which we'll have on our blog. Now, is this the picture that the trooper... I'm assuming that the trooper took this picture? That's a funny assumption. No, and I'll get to that. (laughs) Okay, but this is her actual car? This is her actual car. That's not like a recreation or anything like that. That is the actual accident scene. And you can kind of see... You know, it's not great quality, but you can kind of see the board on the back. I can see that it's also it's not like the car was backed up straight into the house it looks like it's kind of at an angle Mm -hmm. and it's kind of hard to tell from this picture but it looks like there might be tire marks in the grass which is what i was assuming that i was was going to be one of my next questions Mm. because it seems odd that the car would be would back up into the house yeah i was wondering if the car had spun out like in the grass Mm around the house and then hit and hit the house. And it does kind of, it almost looks like there's tire marks in front of the vehicle that maybe indicate that it spun out. I don't know. It's hard yeah. to tell from that picture. Um, it does appear to be the case. Now you can see also in the background of the photo that there was some snow on the ground. Right. Apparently um, that's a better angle. Okay. Yeah. Apparently there was more snow on the ground the night of the 19th. Okay. Meaning that the car at the time of the crash, like there might've been snow where the car was. This other picture, it's a better angle. Um, I would say that it doesn't look like the car spun out, but you can clearly tell that the wheels are turned. Yeah. Maybe she was backing up. Uh, it's, It's just, it's hard to tell from the poor quality of picture. Was there anything, did he indicate anything, uh, uh, any tire marks or any, any, anything like that in his police report? No. Was there a police report? I don't know if there actually was. Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to get more into that. Um, so like I said, no sign, of, he said that the interior of the car looked normal, no sign of a struggle, like nobody was around. And instead of looking further into the car, like opening the glove compartment to see if the registration was there, which it was. Mm -hmm. And the registration was in Kelly's name. Mm -hmm. He decided to work off of the paychecks that he found on the seat and look for Brianna. Okay. Yeah. Doesn't seem bad, right? Like, you know, if he found her like that would have taken him to the person who was driving the car that night. Not that he, you know, knew that. So, He called a tow truck to come get the car, and he took off. The trooper drove to the Black Lantern, but it was closed. Early articles say that other work kept the trooper from following up for the next two days. But by the time that episode had disappeared came out in 2011, it uh, turns out that he just had the next couple days off. He he didn't pass that off to a, a, a trooper or somebody that he knew was working, or maybe his supervisor, say, hey... I found this car. These are the circumstances. This is who I think was driving it based on the fact that there were uncashed paychecks. Like, I I just, why was, why? Well, Daniel Bijibing, commander for the St. Albans State Police Barracks, said that the trooper, quote, assumed that sooner or later the vehicle's owner would come in and ask where the car had been towed to. 
in this county, we get a lot of abandoned vehicles, end quote. Basically, what he thought is that it was a drunk driver who crashed into the house, got scared and took off. Okay, but but he didn't file any reports on the abandoned car that we know of. Mm -mm. Like he didn't he didn't it just impounded the car, didn't file a report of like found property indicating anything about the scene. Like there, there's no indication there just from a car being backed into a house and nobody around that. Why, why would you assume that it was a drunk driver? Other what than I, the fact that that happens a lot around there. Sure. But why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you file a report saying there were tire marks in the snow that it made it appear as though the vehicle had spun out or that there was some damage to the car, some damage to the house. He, he, you said that wasn't the picture that the trooper took. So, and then you said that he, the trooper took the picture out of his notebook. Yes. The initial picture that he pulls out of the notebook is very confusing because I've heard several different versions of how the trooper got that. The first thing I heard was that the owner of the house gave it to him, like took the picture and gave it to him, but the house was abandoned. Right. Then another article said that the trooper took it, but Brianna's parents have said in, you know, different newspaper interviews that there were no police photos of the scene. Okay. So I think more likely where it came from is the thing I'm going to get to in just a minute. So whatever his reasoning was, and it doesn't make sense, it basically like he just made an assumption, went with it. He had a long weekend coming up, wanted to get off shift, didn't want to do the paperwork is what it sounds like. Okay. It's just, it's just so frustrating. Like, yeah, it's imagine how Brianna's parents feel. It's, I just, I, I don't understand how you, how you can, how you can do that. Like how you can just put off, like you impounded a piece of property. There has to be some report of it. Like, I mean, like what if he assumed that somebody was just going to show up? and start looking around for the car, there's no report of this vehicle. I mean, there might have been a report that said a green Oldsmobile was found abandoned, but he never looked to see who it was registered to. So the owner was never contacted by anybody. Um, that would have been in a report if there was a report generated. So like, there was nothing connecting the car to anybody until the Maitlands came in on Thursday to report Brianna missing. He doesn't even need to look in the glove box to find out who it's registered. He just runs the plate and the registration comes back. Yeah. Well, he like, didn't want to, he was going home. <laughs> I mean, it's just boop, boop, boop Dude. on the computer. Like it's, it's, I know how to run NCIC. Like it's, it's a real easy system. It's really easy to yeah. do that. It, it'll take maybe a minute. Well, he didn't do it. And this decision meant that the investigation was starting nearly a week after Brianna was last seen instead of the morning after. Brianna's disappearance hit the newspapers the next day, March 26th. The first article I found was in the In Brief section of the Burlington Free Press. It said that Vermont State Police were searching for a 17-year-old girl who had last been seen a week ago. Now, these short early newspaper reports about missing people are often inaccurate, so I don't know what to make of this next detail. It says that, quote, she was last seen leaving work on March 19th when she mentioned plans to make a short trip out of the area, police said, end quote. Yeah, where does that come from? No idea. I mean, according to this, police, but I have never read another article that said that that's what she said when she left work that evening. That's not the version of events that was in the episode of Disappeared. I don't know. I don't know where the information came from, but it is a direct contradiction to the note that Brianna had left earlier that day for Jillian. Oh, uh, speaking of which, where is this abandoned house in relation to the path that she would have traveled from the restaurant to her apartment. So it's only about a mile away from the restaurant. Okay. But I don't it, know in which direction, but it's very close to the restaurant. 
I'm just curious if this is a house that's on her, what would be considered a normal route of travel, yeah. or a relatively normal route of travel to her apartment. Yeah, I'm not sure. Or if it was out of the way. Right. In the, if it, yeah. Op, in the opposite direction exactly. or in a different direction. Yeah, it might have been. So I know it was, like I said, within a mile, but I'm not sure beyond that. Because if, I mean, if it, if it was in the opposite direction, then maybe that would lend some credence to the statement of right. her planning to go somewhere else. Yeah, definitely. But if it just happened to be an abandoned house on her normal route home. Then that doesn't show anything. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So I don't know what to make of this detail. Like, is it a simple mistake? Did something get lost in translation? Or had Brianna's plans changed while she was at work? I'm also assuming that since this stellar state trooper uh, (laughs) did not run the registration, did not do anything other than impound the car. You said that there was more snow on the ground, according to somebody, the state trooper, maybe. Uh, No, not according to the state trooper, according to Bruce, uh, Brianna's father. So basically that detail came out in one of his interviews where he was expressing frustration at this state trooper because he said he didn't take photos. There was snow on the ground what that night so, and so footprints there could have yes, been footprints that's exactly where, that's where i was going exactly and that's where bruce was going but by the time that picture was taken the next morning the snow had started to melt right so and so evident, any footprints is gone gone right mm-hmm. once the connection was made between brianna and the crashed car the search began in earnest the Maitlands passed out hundreds of flyers, and the troopers did their own search, bringing in dogs and a National Guard helicopter. By the next week, the Class Kids Search Center came to Vermont to offer their assistance. On Friday, April 2nd, the group set up a command center at the Montgomery Town Hall. Vermont State Police also performed a forensic analysis of Brianna's car, but according to Lieutenant Thomas Nelson, who was heading up the investigation, nothing too valuable was found. He told reporters that they found, quote, no obvious signs of foul play. There was no obvious sign of a struggle, end quote. So I guess we're to assume that in doing that also, they tested for blood and other potential bodily fluids in the car as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, there was nothing visual that they found, right? So, like, no blood stains or whatever. And then, yeah, they did forensically examine the car, quote unquote. So, yes, fingerprints, you know, maybe swabs. I don't know. I mean, I would hope that they would because, well, I guess there wasn't really a whole lot of time when the car was found. So, Potentially, there wouldn't have been a whole lot of time to clean anything up. Yeah, it doesn't sound like there was. I think that whatever happened in the car, there might have been like basic attempts at cleanup um, if something did happen in there. But yes, it, it's not like they had the car for days or or anything like that. That, as, as far as a crime scene goes, was already compromised anyway because it was impounded and not, right. not treated as a crime scene. So... We don't know who was actually in and out of the car anyway. So there's potential evidence lost there if there was evidence of someone else being in the car. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest potential loss of evidence comes with potential footprints in the snow. Right. I think that's the biggest thing. Um, I, I would assume that everything within the car was pretty much preserved, you know, more or less. Sure. I don't think there was like a, a lot that was lost there. Just as an aside, I didn't even put this in, uh, but this was in the Disappeared episode, and it's just horrible. So remember how earlier I mentioned that the trooper didn't look in the trunk because he didn't have the key, like the keys weren't in the car? Yeah. So once the Maitlands were told that the car was in this impound lot, they went there, and obviously they still didn't have the keys, and Bruce... Brianna's father was told that they never went into the trunk. And so he took a crowbar to the trunk with the fear that his daughter was in there. Yeah. And thankfully she wasn't, but holy, like, can you imagine as a father taking a crowbar to a car trunk thinking that your daughter might be there? I mean, no, I can't imagine that. Yeah. And, and I can't imagine it even even 
compounding that it being in police custody and that right and potentially being a thought yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. i mean how uh, can you imagine if she had been in there and it's like three five days later or whatever and they're like oh well there she is millionaire i mean if, i mean yeah. sue the shit out of that i know but uh just but the whole yeah, thing is no awful. absolutely awful i would be curious to know damage to the car mm-hmm. i mean obviously i know it's an old beat it's up a car <laughs> yeah but like that's the thing you can like run that thing into a brick wall and it would probably just be fine i would be curious about known dents on the rear quarter panels mm. previous to this accident or whatever mm-hmm. however the vehicle ended up uh into the house why because that's how you pit somebody out how you knock them off the road Oh, so your your theory is that she was potentially knocked off the road, and that's how she ended up there. I don't know. Uh, well, yeah, but but because the, I mean the, the, house- the evidence the evidence to that would be either would be new damage to one of the rear quarter panels mm-hmm. that were not there and was not obvious impact from the, the house, house mm-hmm. as well as tire marks in the grass or the snow, right? Of spin out of some sort. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. That's interesting, though. And and it should be said that the house was like right off the road. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that is definitely possible. We're not talking about like some abandoned house, like in the middle of the woods or anything like that. Like it is off a major road. Okay, so we've got the car. Brianna has been reported missing. The police are like taking it seriously. They've done their own searches. The Maitlands have been, you know, handing out flyers and the class kids search center came into town and led searches over the weekend with 300 volunteers searching on foot Friday and Saturday with an additional 100 who came out on Sunday, April 4th, ahead of a winter storm that was supposed to last until Tuesday. So a pretty robust um, response. Absolutely. And then I don't know the exact timing but at some point the police had divers there was like there were bodies of water nearby they had divers go in there in addition to the canine searches and the helicopters and the foot searches that storm obviously put a damper on the foot searches so the center for the rest of the week focused on putting up more flyers and answering calls on the newly established tip line as the week wore on The class kids volunteers were only able to stay in Vermont for the week, so the following weekend searches were organized by Brianna's family. Bruce told reporters that they would be focusing on, quote, a few areas where people last weekend found strange or unusual things, end quote. What does that mean? We don't know. Um, It didn't really end up being anything because we never heard anything more about it. Yeah. But, you know, things were found. They followed up. The initial days and weeks of the investigation brought in plenty of tips. There was a white pickup truck that had reportedly been parked nearby on the night of March 19th. There was also a report of a man heard shouting late that night and another man who had been flirting with Brianna at work. So this is like kind of the situation where everybody's just like calling in anything that's happened, you know? You said there was a report of a white pickup truck nearby. Nearby what? Where, nearby the house. Where she was working yeah. or the house? No, no, no. The abandoned house. Okay. hmm And a man shouting... Yeah. By the house? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, ju- I'm just wondering, you know, where well, exactly. these tips yeah. were Geographically. coming in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A few people reported having seen the car out by the house that night, uh, with one of those witnesses being one of Brianna's ex-boyfriends. So he was apparently driving home after a night out in Canada and saw the car around 12.15 to 12.30. But he didn't realize at the time that it was Brianna's car. Okay. Now, interestingly... So 12.15, 12 12.30 a.m. Yeah, she, exactly. She left pretty close to midnight, right? No, 11.20. So this is about an hour after. But there were other people before that who saw the car. Okay. And one witness, and again, I don't have the exact times for these witnesses. One witness said that they saw the car with the headlights on. Oh. Another witness said that they saw the car with the turn signal on. Interesting. Mm-hmm. 
but we don't have exact. Do we have I don't rough, have exact time. Rough times? No, the only one that I had the rough time on was the ex boyfriend who said it was between twelve fifteen and twelve thirty, and that got narrowed down later because in initial reports it was like sometime between eleven thirty and twelve thirty. Mm, sure. But then they narrowed it down from there. But as far as the other witnesses, I'm not entirely sure. But it was all around that time. And we're just going to assume that the police checked the ex boyfriend's alibi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. mean, un- understandable I know, I know. that there's there, there's <laughs> no there's no connection. Sure. There's no con- Well, yeah, clearly, <laughs> no connection. I understand, but you have to. I mean, like sh- he is an ex boyfriend, so you yeah. have to assume that there's at the very least a mild potential that he. Oh, could be absolutely. A yeah, no. So he was checked out. Also, Healy was checked out. Yeah, I I wanted to ask what make and model car she has. Yeah, so I don't it, know. Is, is it a white pickup truck? Not as far as I know. Okay. Um, but Keely was checked out because, you know, obviously they had had an altercation, yeah, a pretty right. bad one just a couple weeks before. And, you know, at the time, Brianna was pressing charges, although... So she did file the police she report. She filed the, the police report, although she had told people privately that she probably wasn't going to go through sure, with pressing charges. That's, prime, that's suspect number one. Oh, for sure. But like Keely didn't know that, right? And then Shauna on that episode of Disappeared said that like she ran into Keely and was like, oh, hey, so like what's going on with the charges? And she's like, well, Brianna's not here. So nothing, I guess, you know, something along those lines, like very smug and shitty. Mm, yeah. And so I think Shauna's like, okay, what? <laughs> so yes, the police absolutely did look at her, but she was cleared. On the morning of March 20th, before the car was towed, two separate motorists came upon the wreck. They both thought that this was so interesting that they took photos. Okay, so those are the photos. That's where the photos... But, like I said, I don't know where the initial photo in the trooper's notebook came from. I'm assuming it has to be from one of these motorists, because, like I said, Bruce has said in many interviews the police took no photos... I did read somewhere that the owner of the house gave the police a photo, but there was no owner of the house. So I have to imagine it's one of these two motorists. Maybe one of those two motorists called it in. Exactly. Met the trooper out there. And And then then, said, hey, I took pictures. I'll give you one when I get it developed or whatever. I would would really be curious to know if once she became a missing person, if anybody asked the trooper questions about tire tracks, about footprints in the snow— anything that he observed. Clearly, they're not going to say anything publicly because, you know, if he was like, oh, yeah, I saw, looked like the car spun out and the tracks went off in this direction. And then state troopers are going to be like, yeah, maybe maybe shut up about that. No, I'm sure they did only because Bruce and Kelly, I mean, the Maitlands in general, like really, really kept the heat on the Vermont State Police. Good, they should. So, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, to that point, the relationship between the Maitland family and the Vermont State Police certainly had its ups and downs during this time. I'm sure mostly down. Yeah. Bruce was critical of them for fucking up the whole car thing and getting the investigation off to a late start, as you can imagine. Five days is putting it as a late start is mild. Yeah. When you're talking about a missing person. Yeah. Potentially in the woods of Vermont. Mm hmm. Like. Five days is a huge deal when you first encountered evidence of something like that. That is a huge time gap. No, it is. Like, of course, of course, this trooper is not going to happen upon an abandoned car and think, oh, it's a missing person. But to not file any paperwork or do any follow up thinking, eh, I'll get around to it after my weekend. Well, listen. I think there's a reason that in 20 years they've never named the state trooper. Uh, for sure. I mean, I hope he or she probably learned his lesson from it. He's probably chief. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're right. <laughs> Even though they got off to obviously a rough start to put it mildly, Bruce publicly praised the work that the troopers have been putting in afterwards, like after the actual search started. No, it right? sounds like they took it seriously yeah, yeah, yeah. eventually. But by April 17th, nearly a month after Brianna va- vanished, he was singing a different tune. Bruce wrote a letter to the governor of Vermont, Jim Douglas, in which he appealed for help in the investigation. 
He said that the police investigation hadn't been aggressive enough and that they were keeping his family in the dark about what was being done. We see this a lot. It is. In a lot of cases. Yeah. And I can almost guarantee you it's because there is no training in missing persons cases in law enforcement. So they take it, the investigators of this, quote unquote, are probably homicide investigators. Mm Mm-hmm. Or major crimes investigators who are taught that to keep the family basically out of it because they're potential suspects. Well, in missing persons case, if you've already cleared the family, they're not suspects. Yeah. Get them involved. It's, but it's the same thing with, with public outreach. Put more information out when it comes to a missing person. It's not a homicide. You're not going to, at least it's not a homicide yet. Right. You're not going to potentially compromise evidence or influence a suspect or whatever when you're looking for somebody it's it's hard because you know you're right the police come from a thing of like we have to do our investigation we don't actually answer to you keep everybody out yeah but you know this family's frantic right the investigation got off to a late start and they want to know every single thing is being done right right so in the letter he said quote As the parents, we receive many tips that we forward to police. Are they acted on? Who knows? Police tell you nothing about what they are doing with your case and tips, but we know the results. Nothing. End quote. And that's what I'm saying, especially in a case like this. So it's a small town. Yes, I understand state trooper, but there's some some investigator that's assigned to it. There's probably Mm -hmm. a team behind that investigator, but there's some lead investigator. There should be a point A yeah, there is. Yeah. single point of contact for that family to go to. Right. And that single point of contact should be keeping the family in the loop and keeping the family on the inside saying, look, this is what we're doing. You cannot say X, Y, and Z publicly for potential things down the line. Yeah. But I want you to know this because you need to know what we're doing. That would be a better way of going about this. Yeah. So apparently that wasn't happening. Bruce went on in the letter to clarify that he appreciated the work that the troopers had put in individually, but said that some of the tips he had received were, quote, downright distressing, end quote, and he wanted to know if there was any veracity to them. So he was receiving horrible tips about what had happened to his daughter. He was desperate to know If this is just, you know, cranks, if like this is bullshit, like just cruel people or right, if something horrible had happened to his daughter. Yeah. So by this time, rumors are flying with people saying that Brianna was being held in a basement somewhere, that she had been murdered and fed to pigs, like all sorts of terrifying, awful scenarios. Bruce's letter ended with, quote, I don't need some higher official to call me and tell me the police are doing their job. Just sit by the phone and don't worry. I've done that with no results, at least none shared. While my daughter may be in a living hell with odds of rescue diminishing daily. End quote. So what's fucked up is like in this article where I got this quote, like there literally was a quote from the governor's office and they're like, well, he hasn't gotten the letter yet, but you know, basically like the police are doing everything they can. And you know, like exactly what he was saying he didn't need. Yeah. He doesn't need. Yeah. A hundred percent. That's just fluff. It is. It's fluff from a politician. It's fluff from the chief of police. Like he, you're right. He doesn't need that. Yeah. And that's all he got. By the next week, the Maitlands announced a $6,500 reward for Brianna's safe return or for information that helps convict those responsible for her disappearance. That reward would eventually grow to 20000 This is also when we first started to hear about possible connections between Brianna's disappearance and the activities of known drug dealers in Franklin County. What now? Yeah, Franklin County State's Attorney James Hughes wouldn't give many details, but told reporters that his office staged a series of interviews on April 17th. According to Hughes, quote, it did eliminate a couple of theories, but it opened the door to a couple of others, end quote. That's a very vague statement. After this, after the state's attorney came out and said that he'd been conducting these these interviews and were starting to hear talks about like drug dealers in the area, police were classifying Brianna's disappearance as suspicious and saying that they couldn't rule out foul play, 
but they were still stopping short of calling it an abduction. Call it whatever you want. At this, I mean, she's seventeen years old. It's not like calling it an abduction is going to issue is going to like issue an Amber Alert or anything like that. Like so, I mean, it would. Like that is one of the criteria for Amber Alerts, and and Amber Alerts can go up till you're nineteen, I believe. Oh really? I yeah. thought th- I thought there was like. But a in two thousand four, I don't know if they were in Vermont yet. Yeah. So I mean, that's not the point. But like, it does change the investigation. You know, a car left abandoned with somebody that they think ran off is a different investigation than somebody th- they think was abducted from the car. Sure, initially, but at this point, it's already too late as far as evidence from the car. Yeah, but again, it changes who you're interviewing, how you're interviewing, how many people you're putting on it, you know, all of that. Yeah. So on May 26th, about two months after Brianna was reported missing, Kelly wrote a letter to the Burlington Free Press that she titled, My Daughter is Not a Runaway, Brianna Was Abducted. In it, she talked about a relationship with her daughter, saying that they respected each other's privacy, but that they were close and visited with each other often. She then went over their day together on March 19th, which we already talked about, and talked about how happy Brianna seemed and that things were generally looking up for her. Kelly then went on to discount some of the alternate theories around Brianna's disappearance, including the idea that she ran away. Kelly pointed out that aside from Brianna not taking her car or her last two paychecks, she also didn't take any clothes, makeup, her contact lenses, her medication, or even her hairbrush. Or even her ATM card. Exactly. So she has no access to money except maybe potentially cash that she has on her. Right. And I don't know if she had any credit cards or whatever, but I mean, it doesn't seem like they were used if she did, you know? Right. She also stated her belief that the car was crashed against Brianna's will. And this is an interesting theory and not one that I had considered. Kelly says, quote, why, if this had truly been an accident, had the car traveled beyond the house, then reversed at enough speed to launch it up onto the building's foundation? My daughter would have been too terrified to do this herself, but it would have been a powerful scare tactic used by her abductor, end quote. Okay, so judging from that picture, the car wasn't anywhere on on the foundation no it kind of was so there have been like close-ups um where it shows that the car broke through and like the back wheels were resting on the foundation of because it's not a slab foundation like no basement no i understand that yeah yeah so the back wheels were resting on it let me see those pictures again (laughs) well okay so i can kind of see what she's saying it's not resting on like on top of the foundation, the rear wheels are backed up against the slab foundation. Mm -hmm. So I can kind of see what she's saying there, but just goes back to the same thing. Like the, the, the angle of the tires versus the impact of the house. Like I just, I don't, I don't see this as somebody accidentally backing up into the house. It just doesn't no, it just doesn't I, make any sense. Yeah, to me. I don't think that it was an accidental like oopsie daisies. But I would really like to know what if there was damage to the driver's side rear quarter panel. Mm. Cuz there's no obvious damage in at least in this picture to the passenger side rear quarter panel. Yeah, and the only pictures I've ever seen are these yeah. of the accident site. I've never seen photos of the car. The other after, side of the car. Yeah, like after it was towed or anything like that. By June, investigators and reporters were looking to see if Brianna's disappearance was linked to two similar ones nearby. As soon as Brianna's story hit the news, the family of missing New Hampshire college student Maura Murray wondered if the two disappearances could be connected. 21-year-old Mara had vanished five weeks prior to Brianna after a car accident in New Hampshire. Her abandoned car was found, but with no sign of Mara. Then, back in Vermont, 35-year-old Jody Whitney was reported missing on May 27th. Her abandoned car was found the next day. So within a couple of months of each other, you have three women in New England who had gone missing, leaving behind abandoned cars. If we're trying to connect these, and my question then would be, are the roads where these cars are found, 
are they similar? Are they are they off the beaten path kind of roads? Or are they major highways? Yeah, so I don't know about Jody, where her car was found. Brianna's car was found in a pretty, you know, a fairly well traveled area. Oh, okay. Mora's car. I mean, it was rural, but again, I mean, several motorists came by and noticed right. her, right? Right. Mora's car was more um, remote. Okay. So, yeah, I, and not, there's nothing on the surface that would link them together in that regard. Eventually, no link was found between Brianna and Mora's cases. Jody Whitney's body was found and her husband was convicted of her murder. Maura Murray remains missing. At a June 8th press conference, Vermont State Police started to push the drug angle hard in Brianna's case, saying, quote, Brianna has a very questionable background. She made some unhealthy lifestyle choices. Right. So we can't figure this out. So instead, we're going to say, oh, she was troubled. Yeah. And that's the reason why we can't find her. Mm hmm. Sure. Exactly. Now, interestingly, he went on to say that Brianna had told her co-workers that she was going to, quote, go socializing after work, which is a third version. Yeah, I was just going to say, so what (laughs) version are we on now? Yeah, no, that's the third one. And not in that order, necessarily. right? Right. So the very first version was she was going on a short trip after work. Because that was right. in the that was newspaper, in the, like the, re- the day after. She but was that was also missing. according to police. Yeah, according who, to the reporter, according to police. Right, right. And at that at that point, we don't even know whether police had interviewed her. No, her coworkers. Yeah, no, we have no idea. Right. So that was the first story. Um, I think technically this one's the second that she's going to go socializing. The version that I went with in the beginning was from the episode of Disappeared. So 2011. So either way, we've got three different stories yeah. as to what she was actually doing that night. Right. And, but we do know that she did write a note to her roommate yes. saying that she was coming home right after work because she had an early shift the next morning right? at a, at her second job. Exactly. And so the only one of the three options that we've heard so far that lines up with the note that we know is a fact is the first one that I went with, the one from Disappeared, saying that, you know, she was going right home after work at 1120, which put her right in line with what she said in the note. Police said this, that she was going to go socializing, but they, at that point, hadn't found anyone who admitted to seeing or speaking with her after leaving the restaurant. Right. So, so, like, where, so where's the drug Where was angle? she going socializing yeah. with? Yeah. And again, if, it, if, if, she, if their theory is going to go back to, uh, like, a drug deal gone bad or, mm-hmm. you know, she owed drug dealers money or whatever, once again, ATM card was found uncashed paychecks readily available for them to take and they didn't right so yeah sure we have no idea how much free cash she had on her but it's not like she was a server at the, at this restaurant yeah and that's a good point and you know because again like i've been a waitress and i would come home with tons of cash sure but, but the dishwashers I, don't take a ton of cash no at best you get tipped out by the wait staff, which isn't like a ton of money. It's a small percentage. And, and that's not at every restaurant. No, definitely not at every restaurant. I've only worked at like one where they did that. And yeah, it's not a lot of money. And obviously she had paychecks too. So that's, you would guess that's where the majority of her money was coming from. Right. Right. So it, the, the, that does, that to me doesn't line up. It doesn't make, that doesn't make sense to me. We're going to get heavily into the theories in part two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> As the months dragged on, Bruce and Kelly continued the heartbreaking search for their daughter. They received a tip that Brianna was working at a strip club in Boston. They traveled down and showed her photo to the staff. They ended up finding the young woman who was the subject of the tip, and she did look remarkably like their missing daughter, but it wasn't her. God, that's terrible yeah uh, kelly i know kelly says she's like listen if you weren't her father you would absolutely be like yeah that's the missing girl like she understood it it was a really good tip yeah unfortunately you know it wasn't her it wasn't her another time police found a trash bag in a field the maitlands were told i don't know by whom that there was a body inside it turned out to be a pig carcass 
Kelly, convinced that bad people were behind her daughter's abduction, started driving around with her car doors locked and a handgun nearby. Bruce would see a group of buzzards circling and go investigate to see if it was his daughter that they were going after. Kelly had reason to be paranoid. I mentioned that drug dealers had been talked about by police several times, and this is because several of the tips that they had received revolved around a local drug ring. One tip that seemed pretty credible came about a week after Brianna's disappearance. An anonymous caller said that Brianna was being held against her will in the basement of a farmhouse on Reservoir Road in Berkshire, about 10 miles away from where her car was found. Unfortunately, cases like this often receive tips along these lines, and they turn out to be dead ends. But this one seemed promising, as Brianna did have known connections to the people living in this house. And that's where we're ending this week. Uh, <laughs> this, see, this is what I'm talking about. This episode's already already so long, and we have so oh, so much more to talk about. Okay. So, like I said, we are going to do part two and get it up and available as soon as humanly possible on our Patreon, on Apple Podcasts. For everybody else, it will be up next week, and we will be talking about in part two. This house, this farmhouse near where Brianna went missing, which is a major part of this investigation. And we will talk about what happened to the people who are in this farmhouse and all of the insane connections that went on for years afterwards. So I really kind of, this is where everything went off the rails for me, to be quite honest. I could not stop writing after I dug into all this. So that's going to be in part two. Looking forward to it. Brianna Maitland has been missing from Montgomery, Vermont since March 19th, 2004. She's a white female with brown hair and hazel eyes. She has a faint scar in her left eyebrow to her forehead. She has a nose ring in her left nostril. At the time of her disappearance, she was between 5 foot 3 and 5 foot 5 and approximately 105 to 118 pounds. She was 17 when she went missing. She would be 37 today. Anyone with information regarding Brianna Maitland's disappearance should contact Vermont State Police at 802-524-5993. You can also contact the FBI tip line at 1-800-CALL-FBI or at tips.fbi.gov. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website, and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social. And then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and TikTok. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week or right after this for a brand new episode. See you then. And then they were gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by me, Kona Gallagher. The music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it!